So, how long have we been waiting now for a regular, classic-style DC Multiverse Wonder Woman? It's been 84 years. Eh, give or take a couple. Better late than never. Welcome to Five Points of Articulation, where I review action figures and then articulate five points to help you decide if you want to add that figure to your collection. The five points I discuss are packaging, presentation, posability, playability, and price. I'm Jason, and if you enjoy my content, please like, share, subscribe, do all the YouTube rigmarole. After years of hoping and praying, we finally have a classic comic-style DC multiverse, Diana, and today we're gonna see if this Wonder Woman is worth the wait. Starting off with the packaging, and Wonder Woman comes in an extra-wide window box. And there's definitely no dead space in this one. It's a collector edition, so we have the foil running down the side. More of that on the spine. As for her number, naturally Wonder Woman's a perfect 10. Down here is illegal. And for those of you using apps like Brickseek, here's the UPC. Flipping her around, we have some gorgeous artwork by Terry Dodson. It was taken from the story Who is Wonder Woman? Of course, it also said that on the sign, making it all the more baffling to me why the red tornado wasn't from Tornado's Path. Again, seeing as how they use that cover art. The fact that they're drawing from this story gives me hope that we might just get a Donna Troy, a Cersei, and especially a Cheetah. Given how long it took to get this, though, I get ahead of myself. For now, and for packaging, Wonder Woman gets one whole point. Moving on to presentation, and Wonder Woman stands at a statuesque seven and a quarter inches. Lining her up with some other Wonder Woman figures, and in the case of Superwoman, Wonder Woman adjacent figures, and you can see she is cut from a similar cloth, but the reuse comes from Superwoman. This includes the arms, you can definitely see it at the bicep, and while the bracers have been resculpted, the hands are the same, and so are the legs, with Wonder Woman having new boots. Honestly, this doesn't bother me in the slightest. I like the idea of Wonder Woman being stronger and more powerful. This one really feels like she could put a hurtin' on you. She also looks like she saw your internet browser history and is deeply disappointed. I'm not saying she's ugly or anything, far from it. Flipping her sideways and her profile has a lot of personality. It's a small detail, but I particularly like that little upturn in her nose. Her eyes are vibrant and everything's been painted very nice. Additionally, while not completely the same, there's a lot of similarity between this and Last Night on Earth, so I could see this as two different versions of the same person. It's just that they went with a more serious expression, which is fine for the warrior aspect of her, but not quite so much the diplomat. One criticism I've seen on social media is that her head sits a bit low, and I do agree with that. For comparison, here it is just sitting in place without being plugged in, and I think that's a lot better. The only downside is it makes her even taller. Moving on down, they've done a great job with the costume. I really like this brighter gold that they used, and the fact that the bustier is metallic adds a really nice effect. Granted, it also kind of reminds me of Adrian Palicki as Wonder Woman. There's also some nice wrinkles and line work in there. The belt, similarly, is very vibrant. Tiny a bit of slop on mine, unfortunately. And lest we forget her signature star-spangled dark blue boy shorts. I know they're not boy shorts, but I do love my alliteration, and I love how cleanly these stars have been tampoed on. I just really don't understand why there isn't one there. Not gonna lie, it kinda drives my OCD a little bit crazy. Traversing down the leg, we've already talked about it being from Superwoman, so then let's talk about the boots. For some reason, I can't quite understand they've given them this really crackly leather texture. It does not continue on the ankle ball, nor does the white stripe running down the middle. That also just kind of stops at the toe. There is some interesting tread work, but overall this is definitely my least favorite part of the figure. Well, that or the rotator cuff. On this side the hair does a nice job of minimizing the joints. Here they're just kind of out for the world to see, and unfortunately are quite a bit gappy. Honestly, any criticisms I have are more nitpicks than anything else. And for presentation, I'm giving this Wonder Woman one whole point. Moving on to posability, and I can see a couple of choices here being polar Polarizing. From the top, and of course her head's in a dumbbell joint, and of course that long luscious hair is gonna get in the way of some range. Naturally, she can't look up. She can look a bit down though. No tilt on this side, but a little bit over here. Otherwise, she does get side to side. Moving down, and I am particularly impressed with how high her arm can raise. The rotator cuff gets a lot of range. Again, though, also a lot of gappage. Moving on down, and again, we've seen this bicep swivel before with Power Woman. Very deep double elbow. In fact, the range is so good she can do her famous pose 
Wakanda forever! That's the one, right? Of course, she's got McFarlane's style wrist balls that can swivel and then hinge either side to side or up and down, shifting the torso. And this is the major area that I think a lot of people are going to have a problem with, specifically that she only has articulation in the waist. Of course, that does a wonderful job of preserving all the lines of the sculpt, but from a functional standpoint, how does it actually affect posability? Well, for one thing, she can arch back farther than Elizabeth Olsen is the Scarlet Witch, but she can't really hunch forward at all. That that said, some of the Dianas with diaphragms that McFarlane's made don't get much forward either, and then a couple of them didn't even get a waist cut. Don't get me wrong, I think they could have done better. On the other hand, DC Icons has a diaphragm and an ab crunch, and even that doesn't hunch forward that far. Point being, I think this is more of a female character thing and less of a this particular figure thing. Fortunately, she still gets a great amount of tilt and twist. Below the barely poseable bustier and Diana has the typical McFarlane hips. She can kick this high, which is incredible, and do a perfect split. Alas, no twist at all in the hip. Moving down though, and she does have double jointed knees that bend perfectly, toe articulation, and McFarlane ankles that can swivel, hinge, and like me, warming up to the collector edition line just because we finally got a good Wonder Woman. Pivot. Is this the best articulated Wonder Woman action figure ever made? No. She's plenty poseable enough for me, but I don't need a lasso of truth to know that that lack of torso and thigh articulation is going to be a big disappointment to a lot of collectors. For poseability, I'm giving Wonder Woman half a point. Moving on to playability, and of course Wonder Woman comes with a trading card and a figure stand. Since it's a collector edition, it has some silver foil, and the logo is silver as well. If you want to read about Wonder Woman, pause here. Also because it's a collector edition, it comes with the trading card stand. Luckily, this Wonder Woman comes with a lot more. First up, and here we have her shield. Lots of great little details in there. That double W really stands out in gold. And although it could use some extra painted detail, there's at least a lot of nice sculpting on the inside. I like all the straps and braids on the handle. And even the inside of the shield itself has some nice dings and pockmarks. But what's a shield without a sword? Captain America, that's what. Compared to some other Wonder Woman swords we've looked at over the years, this one is nice and thick, but not too thick. Definitely not too floppy. The hilt is gold with some nice straps. Looking closely, you can even see a star. After quite a bit of finessing with that accessory holding hand, this warrior princess is ready for battle. But let's say an axe is more your fancy. Wonder Woman has one of those too, and it's great. Again, lots of great detail on the blades, and a nice long gold handle. Once you've softened that hand up, you can easily switch them out, or you can swap that fist out for an accessory holding hand, and have Wonder Woman dual wield. There's also an alternate fist for her right hand, and a pair of open hands. I'd have been happy with just the fist and the accessory holding one, so this is a great addition. Lastly, we have the Lasso of Truth. Similar to the DC Direct ones we looked at in the verses, this one is actual thread. And to be honest, a pretty decent length of it. The downside is that once it's unraveled, it doesn't really want to ravel again. The good news is that you actually can tie it into a lasso, so at least it's functional. I think I'm just going to use a plastic one for hanging. But even with everything she comes loaded with, playability is more than just accessories. It's also about how well your figure plays with others. For some of the classic ones, Wonder Women that brought us to this point, and here we have Superpowers by Kenner, JLA by Hasbro, and Superpowers by McFarlane. In terms of mass market releases, and here's DC Universe Classics by Mattel, but for DC Direct, and here's the original 1999 release, the 2003 JLA Series 1, the 2007 Terry Dotson version, the 2009 Justice League of America box set version, and the 2011 Justice League Classic Icons version. Moving on to some Themyscirin supporting characters, and here we have Donna Troy, from DC Multiverse, Cassie Wonder Girl from Mattel Multiverse, and Cheetah from DC Essentials. As for the rest of Diana's Super Friends and for Superman, here we have Hush in Action Comics 1000, and just a couple of my kit bashes. From Custom Kal-El's to Cape Crusaders, and here we have Rebirth and Three Jokers versions of Batman, Nightfall and Year 2 versions of Batman, as well as Blue and Gray and Black and Gray versions of Hush. Zipping over to Central City, and here we have Flashpoint and Rebirth versions of The Flash, as for Green Lantern, and here we have the NECA version of Hal Jordan and the DC Multiverse version of Jon Stewart. Next up is Endless Winter Aquaman with the unmasked Flashpoint Barry Head. And then for some alternate team members, here we have Black Lightning, Martian Man.
Manhunter looking particularly short, fellow Collector Edition Zero Hour Hawkman, and the Target exclusive Red Tornado. On the subject of Red Tornado, I just want to stop and make a quick correction to my previous video. In my Red Tornado review, I incorrectly assumed that this was a new sculpt because I had not personally seen it before. You guys let me know in the comments that he's actually reused from Alan Scott Green Lantern, specifically the Dread Lantern version. You were all very nice about it, and I just want to thank you for informing me. I guess this is just what happens when I fall behind in my reviews. For a relative scale comparison, here's Wonder Woman with Pizza Spidey and the Spectacular Spider-Man. And as always, here she is with Stealth Iron Man. Of course, this brings us to the part that I'm sure you're the most excited for, head swaps. First up, and here's Wonder Woman 1984. For those curious about this particular head, here you go. It's not a firm grip because the peg holes are different sizes. This one isn't plugged into place either. We will be revisiting this body later. In the meantime, of course, this is the one with the tree trunk legs. And a reminder why I'm okay with the fact that the new Wonder Woman doesn't have a diaphragm cut. Next up is the ever popular Last Night on Earth. The skin tones on this one are an okay match. You will still need to do some painting though. Honestly, this puts me in mind of the beginnings of a great custom of Artemis as Wonder Woman. Other way around, and this is pretty cool, only thing I'll say is that the combination of the hair and the cloak kind of forces her head down a bit. Otherwise, this way around, I think you could actually get away with not doing any painting. Here we have Dark Knight's Death Metal. Just like with Last Night on Earth, the hair and the cloak force the head back and down. Unlike Last Night on Earth, you will have to paint this one, but at least the body proportions are similar and it is a pretty cool look. On the flip side, this one sits too high. I should also point out that none of these pegs are matching. Either way, if it sparks your imagination, here you go. Here's the one designed by Todd McFarlane himself. Again, the pegs don't match and you will have to paint this one, but I will say that the inclusion of this head does make it feel more like Wonder Woman and less like a generic warrior lady. Conversely, I know some of you swear by this head, and in fairness, it is sculpted and painted very nicely, and while the flesh tones don't match, the gold and silver does. Here's the platinum version of the one designed by Todd. The color scheme on this one feels a lot more like Wonder Woman, You'll have to do some repainting though because of the skin and tiara. In that regard, you're going to need to either do a full repaint of this head, or at the very least use the other one for the gold. Next up is Endless Winter. If you're okay with a more subdued, less 90s Artemis, this might be a winner. You've already got the ponytail. All you need is some paint and some Namor wings for the boots. Other way around, and once again, the head is forced back and down because of the cloak. They'll probably want to repaint the neck, and if we're being honest, this whole figure could use a once-over. Though not Wonder Woman herself, here we have have Donna Troy as Superwoman from the Crime Syndicate. At a glance, and I feel like this would be a very interesting start if you wanted to make your own 7-inch scale version of Power Princess. It would take a little work, but there's something there. Other way around, and sorry, no dice. Even heating it up, there just was not enough room in there for my pliers to get that peg out, and because the pegs are incompatible, this one is just a bust. Circling back around to that 1984 body, and here we have Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Admittedly, I kind of oversold this head when it first came out, though I I still contend that it's an improvement, but rather than showing you a head swap I've already shown you, I want to do something else. A complete lower half swap. By taking the lower extremities of Shazam Wonder Woman, we now have a kinda sort of version of Rebirth. Yes, the chest armor isn't quite the same, but for as long as it took McFarlane to give us a classic Wonder Woman, this is good enough for while I wait. At long last, the DC Comics Trinity is complete. She skews a bit on the tall side, but given all the figures she does scale with, and of course all of her accessories for playability, I'm giving this Wonder Woman one whole point. This leaves us with nothing left to discuss but the price. As a McFarlane Collector Edition, Wonder Woman retails for $30. Obviously, it would have been great if they could have ditched the foil and trading card stand and sold this for regular retail, but with all the accessories, I have to admit this is one of the few Collector Editions that really does feel its value. For price, I'm giving Wonder Woman one whole point for a wonderful total of 4.5 out of 5. Of course, there is just one more comparison I didn't get a chance to make in this video, but that's a conversation for another day. If you like this video, check out one of these. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again real soon, but until then, play nice and have fun.